Okay, so here's let me let me let me tell you what we've been doing. This is this is our final of the six of six case studies. Um, we've we've been in here all week, deep morning demo, trying to show everybody the platform. We had our first you know public launch of of, of, of Topspin on Tuesday morning or actually Wednesday morning, late Tuesday late Tuesday night. Um, which and after a three year period of, of private beta, working sort of the only invite only artists. We, we, we now have the software open on our website. You can come, you can sign up. Any artist on the planet can, you know, can, use, can use our software. So what we, what we realized really quickly when we were going to come to South By and, and present and demo the software in the morning to artists and, and, and then we talked, do we, do we demo again in the afternoon or do we do, you know, what do we do in the afternoon that, that, that adds value to um, and explains what it, is, what it is that our software does? We, we realized that we have this... We're lo really lucky and sort of you know humbled by this amazing community of artist managers and artists that, that use our platform. That we should actually have them talk about their successes, right? And we should we should talk about the benefits of the software rather than necessarily, you know, which page of the app you go you go to to do a specific function, right? And talk about the philosophy that's behind the app. Try to show people some really practical, real numbers um, in a sort of an egalitarian way, so that makes music marketing in, in better general, you know, in, in general better. Um, and, and so, you know, as a, as a piece of intro, I, I want to, I wanna, you know, thank these guys a lot because the, the numbers these guys are about to show are, are great and real and, and, and very frank and helpful. Um, and these guys are also a perfect example of, you know, a, a really true modern um, and, and forward thinking, you know, direct to fan centric, you know, you know, business, right? Um, the, the album, the artwork is great. The, you know, the, the music is fantastic, the artwork is fantastic, and the business strategy and the, and the independence and the, the sort of fierceness of spirit behind it is also, like, I think, you know, a, something people should pay attention to. I really could hold Civil Wars up as a model of how to do this right going, going forward. So, that said, um, let's, get, let's get right into it. Um, Nicole, on the, on the end, is, uh, works on our pro services team. Um, that team inside of, inside of, inside of Topspin is, um, is, sort of, is sort of tasked with working directly with artists to push and pull and kick the tires of our software and figure out where it's lacking and, and how it needs to be, how it needs to change or what new features need to be added for it to be truly a professional grade solution for, for music marketing, right? Our goal as a company is to be, you know, to be Photoshop for music marketing or Final Cut Pro for music marketing, right? We, we look at those packages as, as, peer, as peer sort of pieces of software to us. And we aspire to being that kind of pro-grade solution that's available to anyone. And it's democratizing, it's empowering, but it's available to anyone, but they're definitely professional grade. So what's interesting about this case study is, Nicole had nothing to do with anything involved in, in what you're about Should to see. Should be here, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but what's interesting is Nicole can sort of ask some questions and interview while I kind of guide us and, 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 and sort of host on the webcast. But these guys have done this completely entirely by, them, by themselves. Right. This is this is a, 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 a you know Nate and Travis. Say hi. Hello. <laughs> um, how would you describe sort of your, your company structure aside from you know older brother, little brother? <laughs> yeah, essentially, I, I came from uh, marketing, radio, and then A and R background. You know, A um, and R at a major label. And um, when we started the company, it was you know it was an attempt to try to be a part of you know music business 2.0 conversation about kind of what a new you know, music business, you know, successful, you know, company structure would look like. And um, for me, the core, you know, was really to just start with, uh, you know, kind of the um, the nucleus of what an artist is. Is it a touring act? Is it a licensing act? Is it a radio act? Is it everything? You know, and then kind of build from there. So essentially, it's artist development, I think, is our company. Um, sensibility music, you know, it's, it's focused on you know, uh, music music artists, and um, you know, I think that um, you know, artist development is taking you know shape in the form of management services, label services, you know, publishing, and licensing services. Not that, and yeah, so so we yeah this this act, the Civil War, is we uh, we're both manager and label, and you know, we don't cross, we don't double dip, but you know, within the you know the six revenue streams that are available to an artist, we. You know, we're trying to maximize all six, you know, in different rules. Uh, so right. So let's talk, let's 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 break those six down really quick, just practically for people who are watching. I think that's like you know, listing that out. Let's talk about the, let's tell people which ones we're going to talk about. Sure. Yeah. So I guess here, you know, um, we're definitely talking about merch. Um, it's a huge part of 
our partnership with Topspin in uh, selling our merchandise, you know, the records, the, uh, the vinyl, the limited edition posters, the, uh, the t-shirts, you know, on uh, Direct-to-Fan through the merch store that's on, available on our website. So that's a huge part of it. Um, you know, the recorded, the recorded music, um, you know, being able to, to sell that, whether it be digital downloads. Um, uh, so there's that. Um, what am I missing? We definitely use Topspin uh, to help with touring. Um, we've kind of just scratched the surface in that, uh, but not only driving fans to the shows, but uh, on our horizon is how to um, make ticketing a little bit more lucrative. Um, not just lucrative in terms of money, but people. How can we bundle those with music, bundle those with <laughs> merch, uh, or give uh, our fans premium access to tickets, uh, those are things that uh, it's been in discussion, we uh, we want to do those in, in the coming months, it's been a little bit, uh, it hasn't happened yet, but that's one more revenue stream where Topspin can really help you reach fans in the live show. Yeah, I think what, what's safe to say at this point for us is, you know, our relationship with Topspin started in November of 2010, so, you know, essentially four four months ago and um, you know it's we're really we've just hit the tip of the iceberg as far as you know it came out of the essential of setting up an album you know going through more of a traditional you know cycle of releasing an album a debut album for our artists and uh, and that really um, you know we had some needs that we needed you know to fulfill and so Topspin was you know a full service uh, answer to that but there's so much that we really haven't even utilized yet within well, it's all I did ahead of time, too, though, I think. Like, they, yeah, I mean, it's worth noting, too, the Civil Wars, if you guys haven't heard sort of the buzz about this band coming into South by, it's always fun to hear about the, the bands that have buzz coming in. I mean, the LA Times articles, and you know, they were on Jay Leno, and a closing montage of Grey's Anatomy, and um, Taylor Swift tweeted about them, she's a huge fan. So um, I think it was a couple years ago that uh, some of our colleagues on Mumford & Sons playing in the lobby of a hotel, you know, buzz bands. And this band has just been... Playing, I think twelve shows here this week. Yeah. Um, so taking taking advantage of the of the opportunity uh, done by kind of the rising tide of interest on a beautiful record, um, all by yourself, and you discovered Topspin by you know, basically reading digital music news and, and deciding what is the best tool for my artist right now at this juncture. I think a lot. I think this is, it's a good segue to sort of like walking through what you've done, right? What right. Your project was because you were doing direct to fan marketing without us very, very well ahead of time, right? The, the principles of, yeah. I need fans, yeah. here's the content, it's free. Sure. Get attached to me, Give let's have a relationship, mm -hmm. let's make sure people have the music and can, can yeah. have an opportunity to discover the act. Sure. Or something you were doing without, I mean, our tools are great for that, but you were doing it independently. Yeah, I think as, you know, as a manager, you know, you form your philosophy about, you know, how to go about breaking a new artist or how to go about getting traction or getting momentum. and. You know, coming out of, you know, an experience in the major label system, which I, I still believe, you know, the major label system has a lot of value, but starting with the new act and really, you know, they, they hadn't planned on becoming a band. So, you know, a lot of it was responding to the response, you know, just using simple things like Facebook and posting, a, you know, a bootleg video and having a second album and getting a board mix and realizing, oh, this is good. Maybe we should just put it up online and let people experience it. And those were kind of the way that I approached maybe starting to build a story with the band wasn't top down. It wasn't going to, you know, the gatekeepers at radio or at labels or it was doing because we felt like there was so much we could do on our own in more of a DIY way with going, you know, responding directly to the enthusiasm we were getting online, the enthusiasm we were getting at shows. So that was really kind of, you know, these, these decisions, you know, that were made were really in just response to um, creating an ecosystem, you know, of um, and kind of a, a value system and culture around the band of being generous and um, giving people enough to discover the band and feel like they can have ownership of them. So that's really what. Yeah. Well, let's walk, let's walk through it. I mean, what, I you, guys, you guys started. I'll talk about that first. Yeah, one. yeah you Nate it, referenced yeah. it. Uh, live from Eddie's Attic. We, Eddie's Attic is a venue down in Decatur. Um, it Georgia. was Georgia. Sorry, Decatur, Georgia. Uh, mm. It was the band's second show um, ever. Ever. <laughs> if you if you do a little research, I'll give you a two second version of the band. But they met pretty serendipitously. Uh, they were they both were writing for publishers, uh, 
you know, for different artists and their publishers set up uh, what's typically we kind of refer to as a blind co-write. Uh, people send all their artists, I mean all their writers into a camp or a room and hey, we're going to write some hits for an artist. And uh, Joy and John Paul, the two members of the band, drew straws and ended up in the same room. And they started writing together and uh, just hit off this spark. And that led to a couple months later, they wrote a song together and then they said, why don't we try demoing this and their song, I mean their voices. It was this really organic process of, hey, we've got this band on our hands. Like, and as the songs were coming out, we started saying, let's get some shows. The first one was in Nashville, which we're from, and the second one was in, in, in Eddie's in Decatur. And like Nate's reference, we got this board mix, and we were listening, driving on the way home, we were listening in the van, we were like, this sounds pretty good. Uh, what should we do with it? And this collective discussion happened where it was like, we should just give it. We should see what people think about it, if they like it. And it was like, well, how are we going to do that? Are we going to give it away through... Um, you know, something like Reverb Nation, uh, there's a bunch of different websites, and between us, we just said, you know, screw it. Like, let's just give it. No email, no commitment, you don't need to give us your address, anything. So we set it up, I mean, kind of hack, put it on our server, an email server, put a static <laughs> link with a JPEG, and you click, and it starts downloading. And you up there, uh, since 2009, we've had about 130,000 people download. And we reference that as one of the biggest drivers of the band's story is we would go to a show in Athens, Georgia, Athens, Georgia or wherever, Seattle, or, and people knew the songs that we never put out an album other than this. People were singing along, people knew who we were, and it was just because we said, take it, you know, do something. It's a good testament to how the web works, though, right? The web is efficient for that. You get something that's very high quality, and it's very easy to tell people that you like it. It's very easy to share it with folks. It's very easy to spread it around. Yeah. You know, step one, make great art. Sure. Step two, empower people to share it and talk about it, right? Yeah, yeah sure. It's right. a good way for us to, to begin to create demand in the civil wars, begin to create an interest, you know, without asking anything of anyone. And it didn't cost us anything. It was a twenty dollar, you know, board mix. Right. Right. So down. yeah, and the bandwidth. And yeah. the bandwidth, right. right. <laughs> yeah. It cost a bit. Yeah. <laughs> Alright, so so at that point then this is this is pre topspin, right? Like I, I want to be clear that these guys are these guys are savvy and and, and have rolled this themselves and, and built it. And what's interesting about them is that they come to us that are like, okay, we're into it. Guess what we're not? We're not developers, we're not we're not software folks. We need some tools. We need to do this. We need, we're marketers. We've got something great on our hands that we'd like to market. It's very high quality. How does this work, right? I mean, that's like, let's talk about how that sort of that relationship starts. Well, the uh, the first real thing we utilized with Topspin, um, it, we did a digital forty-five, just a two-song um, download called Tracks in the Snow. It was uh, Tracks in the Snow is the original Christmas song that the band wrote, and then the second song was. Uh, just a really stripped down version of uh, Okomo Kami Manual, the, the Christmas hymn. And uh, we embedded it into a topspin widget, which I think we'll show in a yeah, sec. Yeah, it's on um, one of the future screen grabs um, if you look good. There's a couple. Keep going. Yeah, there's right there on the left. Yeah. And at that point, we didn't even have a website. We were running on MySpace. That was where we were sending people for the free down MySpace and download. I mean, MySpace and Facebook. We were sending them there for the free downloads. We were sending them to stream and find out about the story. And we just put this widget up on MySpace and said we got some new songs to listen to it. I think the number yeah. up there was seven thousand. Yeah, so about seventy three hundred. And you know, the band had um, about eighteen thousand yeah. email addresses that they had imported in, into Topspin. Um, and you know, over the course of the last four months, you know, they've almost doubled their list uh, with seventy three hundred names just from the uh, Traps in the Snow Digital Forty Five. But so what, what, what I like about this story though is that, that you were in, you were really were in transition, right? I mean, right. You were, MySpace page, you knew where you were going to stay, that, that wasn't going to be your primary site, you were going to run a business. The Facebook page was great, lots of people connected to you, but you needed to start putting some back end on it. Yeah. What, I, what I think is, what's, you know, selfishly, what's so fun to talk about with this is that this, you, no website, and yet powerful tools, collecting data for you, distributing content, right. sharing in people's Facebook walls, and you yeah. had a dashboard you could see behind it all the while, you know, you're building, mm -hmm. you're getting your site ready to go, you're making your plans, but it, it wasn't required to have a site, right? And you know, the, the old music business was about how do I get people to have a bigger audience than me to put my stuff in front of that big audience, right? Yeah. How do I get Yahoo or, or AOL or VH1 or anybody music blog? You know, at all you know at all the different levels, right? Your job is to try to put your content on places where there are, where there are people to discover it. 
And it's worth noting that um, These it's, guys did a good job. Yeah, yeah. it's oh, great thanks. to be strategic. I mean, I love it when I actually get to sit down with an artist and do a year-long strategy and say, okay, I know you have a record that's coming out you know, in September and we're going to back things out six months. And that's that's an ideal case scenario. I mean, one of the benefits, though, of Top Spin 2 is if you do need to be reactive, if you need to put up you know, an email for media campaign like that, and just doing what they did with you know MySpace site or Facebook page or whatever property that you have and doing that giveaway takes you know ten minutes. Basically. Oh, you're talking about the Leto thing? Yeah. Well, that's no, no, just... no. I'm talking about just just even putting up an email for media campaign well, just to jump segue, in. Right? Yeah. yeah, it's right. fast. Well, and the reason yeah. it was the reason it was a Christmas song is you know we were moving into the holiday season. Yeah. But um, instead of you know giving away a song from the album, there was a lot of anticipation with the you know kind of the fan base we built up. So instead of giving away you know that song, we figured we'd save it to give it away a little bit later, and we gave away this this Christmas song. So that was kind of the reasoning. But that's a good segue into the, our next widget right here. Uh, Barton Hollow is is the title track from the band's debut release, and uh, we actually were touring when. Uh, Jay Leno ended up becoming a possibility, and it was it was actually, hey, can you perform in what was it six days, five days, three days? Oh. We have, we have, yeah, was, we have a slot in three days. Can you guys do it? And so we obviously, yes, we'll uh, we'll reroute some of our plane plans to get it. But um, we obviously knew that this was going to be a huge moment. It's a driver. It's an opportunity. What can we do with it? And so Nate made a widget for the single and we put that up <coughs> as soon as the thing the Leno appearance aired and we started you know you see the tweets rolling in and you see Facebook updating we said hey you like it here's a place to go go get the song and it again just provided that extra connection uh, for people who had never really heard of us at all but they could latch on to something and we could continue to build that story with them. Yeah, so philosophically that sort of warmed our hearts, right? right. Because what you, what you have there is we, we spend a lot of time building, building an application so that that sort of thing is easy to do. It's quick to publish, it's scalable, you don't have to worry about where the file is hosted, you don't have to worry about is the widget going to get shared in other places, is it going to get embedded, right? You, you can see great data from it, you can see whether it works or not. But, you know, the old music business was put it out there and hope. Right, or old media marketing in general was, put it out there, hope, get us on Leno, let me do my sh thing, I hope that translates into sales, right? You guys actually have pretty good conversion, you know, it's not direct conversion, but sure. the ability to say, look, underneath this appearance now, there's a net. Sure. There's actually now some place to go, there's a call to action here. Mm -hmm. If you liked it, here it is. If you just saw this and liked it, please go share it. If you have a close relationship with your audience, and you know, that's our that's our mission, is to give you a way to, a way to have that, manage that relationship, you can do things like, in a couple of minutes, react to that and put a song out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Even quicker than having it up on you know on iTunes. I mean, which we put right. it up on iTunes too. But it was right. a, it was a both hand. It wasn't everybody just has to go to iTunes and buy it, or everybody has to get it free. Right. It was there, the options were there. Kind of capturing so, fans wherever they might land. So. But I think we we uh, we kind of believe in free. And a lot of labels hate that. How can you give it away? And, and iTunes and free don't have to be mutually exclusive. Uh, we really believe that if if somebody wants to buy something, they will, and if they don't want to, they won't. Mm -hmm. And giving them the option of you can get this for free here, we'll give it to like take it. Yeah. But if you, you know, hopefully people will feel inspired to tell their friends to go to iTunes. Or we just it's out of our hands at that point. We leave it up to the people that if they love it, they'll buy it, and if they don't, especially yeah. within a time frame that we're still creating demand. I mean, you know, you talk about. The U.S. alone, there's 333, you know, million people, and you know, we're at 55,000 albums sold in six weeks. There's so much work there to do as far as creating a demand. So, you know, but what I like is that you don't. Lot, what right? I like though is you don't have to appeal to all, all, you know, all sure. 300 million of those people. Yeah, you're appealing to civil war fans, right? right? And have, that's exactly. a great experience for them. And you guys do a really good job. I mean, what I, what I, Bloody Mary. Oh, thank you. That's <laughs> <laughs> my first Bloody Mary ever. So. Yeah. No way, are you serious? Are you Bloody Mary? Wow, I can't let the panel have not Who else needs one? I don't know Bloody Mary allergies. Well, I like tomato. All right. All right, but no, this is Thank you, Ian. Before the before the waiter came. Yeah, it is a full story. Yeah, it's true. I also want to talk about what you guys did here, right? Because this is this is... This is, these are products that, that would be, especially for a band of your size, no offense, unstoppable at retail, right? Yeah. I, 
I mean, maybe now with a little traction you're having, you might sure. be able to get some of the stuff places. Yeah, we had but. no demand at retail, at indie, indie retail chain, right. you know, the chains. There was no, we knew that, you know, for us, we would be, we were hoping to have like one CD in every, you know, because it's a new band. I mean, you know, so this was a massive solution to be able to sell product to to fans. You don't want to. You don't want to have the question, where can I get your CD, and not know where the answer is. And this was a real easy way to say, here's the answer. It's there. Buy it. You know? And, 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 and vinyl, bundle together with vinyl and yeah, shirt and everything it, else, right? It's worth noting, you know, one of the fun things for me was digging, and we're, we're digging into the stats around this campaign. I mean, I think to say the top spin is data-driven is, is an understatement. Um, you know, we love that. looking at the stats and the whole the whole driving force behind Top Spin um, and vinyl in terms of sales for this band mm-hmm. event, incredible. I mean, the percentage of units, um, and they, they can tell you that they, they ran out, they expected to sell maybe a handful, I think, the first week, and the sales were so were so great that they, um, they around t-shirts vinyl and vinyl, they ran out and rushed and made right. more. Mm-hmm. Tell me, so this is this is, this is is a screenshot of uh, right out of your Top Spin app. Yes. Mm-hmm. What, is, what is that? <laughs> oh, <laughs> essentially, um, Nate, Nate hinted that we had a lot of anticipation, I think because we'd been touring really heavily before there was ever product. And so people were asking, when's your record going to come out? When's it going to come out? And when we finally announced the date, which was February 1st, uh, Nate was like, let's tease quite a bit. Let's find ways to stretch out the news of, here's the track listing, here's the album art, let's space it out. And one of the really key things we did that Topson, um, Topson was that we were able to set up a static streaming page uh, where you can through the player, yeah, you set up a player and you can stream the entire album. What we did was we hit it. We didn't tell anybody, and then we can't. I can't remember if it was forty-eight or twenty-four hours before, but we said tomorrow. I think it was twenty-four for an hour. Tomorrow for an hour at noon, you can hear the whole album. And it was a week before the record came. Yeah, out? Yeah, it was right. It looks before like the record it. Came well, out. That, that's January twenty-fifth. I think it's cool to talk through the chart because the. The chart cuts off actually before you can see the legend and some of the dials and controls and topspin. But so, uh, can you guys tell that this line's purple, that okay. line's green, and that line's orange? Can you guys yes. see that? Yeah. Okay. So the timeline of the chart is subscriber. This is like Thanksgiving. Yeah. Right? This is November twenty eighth, and then this is over here on this far edge is like last week. So this is the whole. This is basically their whole album launch campaign in in a couple of metrics here. So what we have are. The, the purple line are, are the email signups. So this is the growth of the band's mailing list. So this is obviously no top spin. This is the publishing of the first widget, right? The, the Christmas album, yeah. Right, yeah. Christmas album there. Um, and you can tell that that had a couple other spikes where it probably got some promo or embedded mm-hmm. nice places. Um, that and one's, Jay this one's probably that Barton part. Hollow somewhere. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Okay. So then the Barton Hollow widget, another spike for email collections. Um, and then he, he noticed, you notice the orange line's flat, no sales, right? So you're seeing spikes and, and, and trending for, you know, for acquisition here um, of just email addresses. Then the spike comes, which is the, and the, the green line are, are media streams, are, are streams of media. So this line is your, right, the yeah. hidden, like, hey, check it out. All these people, right? So this is going to be nerdy. We're going to park it back to high school. I hope I don't traumatize anybody. The, uh, the area under this curve, Right is the amount of people that were collected, you know, email addresses. Right, so that makes this. Right, so all of these people now have, we, you know, Nate and Travis look at this and go, okay, I know how and where I acquired all of these people. I know whether or not they have the Christmas album or Barton Hollow or both. And then when I when I want to tell them right here, I want to send them a message. I can say, look, people who I know have the music and are anticipating the album. Here come here the rest of the album in this period. And there's suddenly demand for it, and you can see that you know you're talking about 11,000, 12,000 you know streams of the album in, in that really really short period of time because they did all this work on sorry with the projecting all this all, they did all this work acquiring those fans right and you'll notice it pays off again when the, when the time comes the orange line the orange line are dollars right so this is this is this is fight this is sales so all of a sudden you're like. You know, we're not selling anything, we're giving things away, we're being generous, we're creating demand and attracting fans into our network, and then here comes the sales curve, and you'll notice that it has a really nice sustained area underneath it continuously because they've done a good job of acquiring new fans, they get another bump of new fan signups because your sales offer page had a, had a free download on it too, right? Mm-hmm. So yep. here's the offer page to buy the album, 
Here's also the free download incorporated into the same page in case you arrived from a friend or, I mean, you had it, you had it well merchandised, right? Um, so what you have here that is, you know, nice continuous sort of sustained sales because they did this work ahead of time. Another thing is a little, uh, maybe, I don't know, is a little um, uncharacteristic of a, we use our, our email list very, very sparsely and rarely. We, we try not to use it uh, very much unless there's really large announcements, whether it be Leno or a, a big tour or, you know, an album release, you know. So a lot of it is using the, the other top spin um, tools at social media, you know, at social media, at Facebook and Twitter. And we do that a lot. So that's just another reason why, you know, maybe Right. Why it's sustained? Right. Why it's true? Yeah. Right, it's true. Um, which is which is, that's a really good point for everybody that's seen you know people watching online or people paying attention to lots of these case studies. Is that we talk a lot about email acquisition, but we really mean fan acquisition. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, the app has features that are, you know, send this tweet in exchange for a download. Yeah. Right. Like on Facebook or share on Facebook in exchange for this reward or download. Right. Mm -hmm. It's not just give your email address and get a download. Mm -hmm. What was interesting in your case was these specific widgets ended up with great placements great music blogs, placing them. They got distributed around the web in a way that grew your email list in a way it wouldn't have on your, on your well, on the site that didn't exist. I should go back, I should go right, back go actually. Back I should actually go back and say, look, look at all these emails collected before you had a website. Right. <laughs> which is an interest, which is an interesting, you know, asterisk on that whole thing is that you were building the site, the site didn't exist until right here, right? Huh? Yeah. Yep. Well, it was intentional too. You talk about the, the widgets kind of going out into the internet, um, that didn't happen by accident. I mean, some of it did. Obviously, you're, you're pleased when someone who you didn't mean to pick something up. But when it came to PR efforts, uh, working with specific marketing online campaigns, when it came to even talking to some radio stations, we said, like, use this widget. So when, you know, when X publication is writing about us, please put this in the article online so that after hopefully people read an article and want to learn more, it's right there. They don't have to find it. They can see that widget. It's perfectly embeddable. You know, you guys have it where it's shareable through social media. I mean, that's how these things spread is, is really putting the power in the hands of the people who can give it away and, and share it with everybody. Yeah, and I mean, we say this all the time. Um, you know, the top spin tools, if you have smart, the tenets of marketing in a way haven't changed so much. The idea of, of letting fans hear your music and discover your music. That's still the same, but Topspin helps just make it frictionless so people can mm -hmm. share and tell their friends about it. Yeah, so it's, it's a lot, what I think is, I think is, is you know, artful about the way you guys have, have gone about this was, you know, the, the press release was like a good value proposition for folks to do it, right? It's actually good for the publisher. It's good for the blog to say, hey, everybody, come to the blog and get the new Civil Wars track, right? It's, it, and, and it's actually convenient if you just think about it this in just practical music marketing terms. The, it's, it's blogs have to get files, post them, serve them, take them up and down, right? Write the posts, and, they, and they're, they're, their primary function is to want to, is to want to put context around the, around the media, right? They want to give you a review, they want to tell you what's worth seeing, they want to expose you to the, the music. So as, as little time as, as, you know, if you can save them time on having to deal with all the other stuff and give them a great experience where I can hit the button easily and stream the song, or I can enter my email address and down this, you know, download the song, then suddenly you've got the ability to, when you're working a relationship with them, to say, look, we'd love, to, we'd love to do an exclusive with you. We'll give you a widget that even maybe has your logo in the widget or is branded or says, you know, it's exclusive to you. Embed it here. Sharing can be turned off from your exclusive period, turn the sharing on as soon as it's over. Widget will update itself in place. Travel out, people can share it all into their networks. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, on the flip side, you guys get on the back end, you know, in the Topspin app, you guys get to see impression data, you know, you, you know, I know Travis can tell me not if you want to, but I know you, I know you know which blogs give you the most exposure and the most emails as opposed to others, right? I, yeah, you have to watch it. it. That's one of the great things, though, about this interface. Is it's really easy to to see these charts, to see these stats. Um, you can run a specific campaign, set an arbitrary date of, okay, I want to check in next week or I want to check in in two weeks or whatever is, works best internally. But when you come back and you click on that two weeks later, I can see was it successful at this blog or was it success, more successful at this blog. And it's, it's, it's not sifting through Excel spreadsheets that somebody handed me all these crazy things. I mean, it's numbers right there and you can see 
can see the curves. It's, it's really user friendly. And uh, as a marketer, um, the last thing you want to do is just throw something on the wall and see if it sticks. We like to have a plan and know that it's happening. If it's not happening, how can we adjust it? How can we, we tweak to make it work? And it makes it really easy to do that, and especially the timeliness too. If it's not working, I can change it, you know, right. in ten minutes right. to right. customize where I think it'll be better. Um, it's really it makes it a lot more efficient in the initiative you're trying to accomplish. Um, All right, so let's let's um sorry, I'm say let's let's uh, let's go here to the summary because I think like I, I know we're gonna have a ton of questions. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Get through. yeah, we have a bunch of questions online, I'm oh. sure. So let's um if you don't mind, like let's let's. You did the data dive, right? So you kind of yeah. Know what through. and I do want to see. I want to show people the chart for Facebook reach. It's back where the Taylor Swift tweets are, are at the top. Okay. Um. So so this is really cool just to see um sort of the the organic growth of of activity on Facebook. And again, just like the chart that we were looking at before with the work that was being on top, done on Tossman, there's a correlation here. Um. You know, to the activity and the things that, that these guys are doing, that the civil wars are doing. I mean, you talk about a big jump. It was around. 8,000 monthly active users in October, and now it's steady at you know, 35,000 monthly active users. I mean, that number is just climbing exponentially. If you think about all those friends telling their friends, you, know, you start to reach real critical mass pretty quickly as, mm -hmm. um, as the numbers spread. Um, so that was, that was one of the big markers. Um, and the Taylor Swift stuff is just fun. I mean, the fact that she tweeted about the show, it was February 2nd, buying t-shirts, because um, she's a super fan. I mean, now they were set up to accommodate that opportunity. Um, there was a way for people to download the track and discover the Civil Wars in a really easy way. Right. It's hard to do. I mean, the lesson for anybody that applies to any band in this case, right? It's not, oh, be friends with Taylor Swift. The lesson is if if someone or some entity any or friend. some big attention manager or some you know blog, music website. blog right. or some kid who's got a great who got a great Twitter following, if some if someone who who is who has the ability to share your content to a lot of people does that. Please make sure you have a net underneath it so that you know that it happened and you can catch that attention when it when it comes. I mean, she's telling right? her friends essentially, right? She happens to be a very influential person to tell her friends. Yeah, but it's but the it same is no principle that, yeah, it's, than it's, me it's, telling you and you being able to go get it's it. It's only a million times more. more, more Come on, Bob. <laughs> I'm huge on Twitter. That's true. It's true. But 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 the the philosophy is is like it applies to any band, any anywhere marketing yeah. anything, right? It's like look, build yourself a net. When people who are who have the ability to focus people's attention, focus that attention on you, yeah. please catch it. Be ready to capitalize on it. Yeah. Right. And then, you know, again, the music is amazing. So I think that when you have that, people discovering it and just the, the power of word of mouth, and it's, right. it's a big deal. But Travis spends a lot of time, you spend a lot of time making sure people are, it's easy for people to do the recommending, right? That's what we spend a lot of time building software for, but. Yeah, I mean, it's, I think it's important to note that uh, using Topspin, um, the widgets using the top spin tools doesn't mean you just have to do it on your website doesn't mean you just have to do it on a top right. you don't see top spin it's it's a curtain that like it, you just see our band and you see right. us doing things so even Facebook um, we can grow our Facebook audience through top spin we can set up a widget that we only share with our Facebook friends and our Facebook fans um, and that caters to that audience but it comes back to us through Topspin. You don't have to just be in one place with these tools. They can be utilized all over the place. The key is, it all comes back to you. As evidence by and, the hot end of their website. Right, and I mean, but I mean, aesthetics too, now that you guys have a website. <laughs> like that. Um, I, I just still, I still does that remember. It's amazing. We were together in, in, in January. Events, and, yeah. and it was like, so I was like, so what was, I was like, dude, you're, what? So I'm, I'm getting redirected to MySpace? You know? And he's like, oh, we're working on it. I was like, for real? He's like, really? As hot as you are, no website? It's like, ah, oh, I'm fine. And it was, yeah. and it was, it totally was. <laughs> <laughs> but it is cool. It. The time. It's right. <laughs> and it looks great. I mean, you know, it's a simple, it's, it's, a, simple, it's a fairly yeah. simple classic, but I mean, this band already has this beautiful aesthetic. Um, and so if you looked at, you know, the Civil Wars, you looked at Tron, you would never know there's the same infrastructure yeah, right. operating underneath. Yeah. I like this number. It matters. I like this number. That's a good number. Isn't that great? Yeah. Yeah, so, um, you know, the, the, the music sales, and it's interesting. I mean, the, um, we were talking about sort of the, the purchases of vinyl. I think vinyl is 26% of their, of their sales. Yeah, which is, that's a high number for, for a band, you know, over sort of t shirts well, especially and merch. a band with its, where the management company is the label. Right. Uh, yeah. how, well, how are you distributing the, how are you distributing it? Vinyl? Yeah. 
um, it's a direct to fan website, on the website, website only, right? Yeah. Well, there's yeah, a seven inch show. that's that's website only and road only, yeah. and then there's a twelve inch that's distributed uh, through this, you know all the independent retailers. So, yeah. Yeah. When we were looking at some stats earlier, um, one really cool thing you can look at in, within your merch store is you build kind of pricing tiers to cater to your different fans. The kind of entry level ones, they come in with you, get them with a cheap digital download or, you know, right. a, couple, a couple song tester. But then you can build in the deluxe packages of get the whole shebang for an increased amount. And Topson, after the fact, will show you, you know, all the sales reporting numbers, how many did you sell specifically, but they'll also show you what are your averages. And we we're looking right. at, I think it was 24. It's each purchase that we have averages about twenty-four dollars, right. which means that people are buying more than just a CD. They're potentially buying a CD and a vinyl or a CD and vinyl CD. Um, but those things are valuable to us because when we're ready to do some more exclusive, uh, maybe we want to do an exclusive pressing of vinyl or some exclusive T-shirts, we know that we can maybe bundle it into something more expensive <laughs> or right around that area. We can use that to our advantage. To, we know that people are willing to spend a little bit more. So let's give them something more right. you know, for that. It's well, I mean, it's like, it's, I mean, I, I always liken this to the experience of being a kid and loving loving bands, right? Like, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a mid nerd for Buzzcocks. I got this, I think that band is the best ever. And the only product I could get was the same product everybody could get, right? So, it, it, like, the guy sitting next to me who was, you know, just kind of likes, you know, you know, orgasm addict or a couple other songs, right? Like whatever songs he likes. He just likes two songs. He gets the same product that I get, right? Whereas I, I know all the lyrics, I got all the B sides, right. right? I got a shirt. It's like mm -hmm. it was really hard for me as a, as a kid to have a bigger, cooler product, right? And then you know, some sort of deluxe edition or whatever would come out months later after demand had engaged and people realized they had something so they'd go give you extra tracks or reissue or remount deeper, you know, expanded version, I'd always be kind of pissed because I only you know, had 10 bucks and I bought this little thing here and I would, I would have wanted the $20 one, but I already bought the $10 one and I want to buy it again. Yeah. And so but what, what's, what you guys are doing is sort of flipping that over, right? It's going, hey, look, let's take this deluxe nice piece with the shirt and the and the seven inches road only that's or, or website only that's hard to find and there's some downloads in the Christmas album and let me get, let, you know, if you're a completist or if you're a real fan, you don't really want to sell that person a $9.99 download, right? You want to sell that person a $35, you know, piece of amazingness and actually that's what they want to purchase. So it's kind of a win, kind of a win-win, right? Yeah. And it opens a lot of doors too to get creative. Um, we're fortunate to work with a band that wants to do creative initiatives in terms of whether it's the songs that they're playing, uh, the product that they're selling, they want to kind of be outside the box. And being it, having these capabilities with deluxe packaging means we can do a limited edition printing. We can do hand artwork that is only available to 25 people if we want to for a high price, or we can do mass, you know, production of, of really cheap things. And it gives you just so much versatility to, rather than just like here's our CD, we're gonna put it in a store and hope that it sells. You can engage where fans are at, which is, I mean, it's kind of what it needs to be nowadays. It should always be music is not. How can we get fans to come to us? It's how can we find where they are and give them what they want. Right. Yeah, it's really well said. Right. And yeah. Do we want to buy it on Facebook? Cool, buy it on Facebook. Yeah. Please do. Yeah, and Topspin has right. integrates into Facebook. Our store is on Facebook. Yeah. <laughs> Cheers. It's yeah, very it's spicy. Okay. Yeah, it's super <laughs> spicy. I had to switch my code because I got a half like a bottle of Tabasco. Got you. Way to go. <laughs> <laughs> <There's no laughs> <sentence. laughs> Let's do let's do let's do questions. Um, you well, have wait, can I say one thing that I want totally. to wrap up with our story, yeah. which is um, that you know the civil wars just and this is just such a great sort of uh, narrative. It's, it's unusual, but it's getting to be a little bit more common. Um, which you guys went through a pretty uh, big courtship period recently with a bunch of label for a few weeks, um, and you met with a lot of great people, a lot of labels that we're really close friends with that we love working with. Um, but you guys are going to stay independent, right? For now, yeah. It's I mean, pretty, it's, that's amazing. You know, we feel like there's there's partners in place. You know, we have an amazing, you know, uh, publicity company we work with, Saxon Co. And, and we have Topspin, and we have we have a Saxon you know, Co. We have here. a Saxon Co. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And um, you know, I think you know, for us, it's been about when a need uh, has has um, been um, we've become aware of a need. 
then we need to find solutions for that. And I think for us, as we're midstream within this album, you know, there's there's other people that we can kind of bring on board to our team instead of you know re, you know, kind of repositioning and re you know addressing the whole setup. So so for now, you know, we feel like if it's working, let's just kind of throw some fuel on the fire instead of you know going to another. Right. You know, there's also system. some so, level of satisfaction in that. Um, we'd be lying through our teeth if we said we thought this would happen. Um, you know, she joked earlier about us running out of product, it's because we expected to sell a couple thousand records. And, and then we, we wanted it to be a slow build, that's what we've been working for for years, and we expected that to continue. And uh, when first week happened, and we were watching our album find the number one on iTunes, and we were watching, you know, it was like, okay, what the heck is happening? You know, and then Soundscape comes out and you're going, like, this just totally changed the game. But that doesn't mean you have to change your strategy. And our strategy was go for the long term, uh, let this take a while, let there be true growth rather than artificial growth. And uh, we feel like keeping it with the team in place is the way to make that strategy continue. It's just, just let it run its course. So. That's a great That's awesome. story. We're really excited awesome. that you're sharing it. Any questions on the chat? Yeah, we had a question yeah, a minute ago. Funny. First of all, I just want to say that you guys, uh, even though this group only fits about 50, we've between somewhere between 450 and 500 people watching this whole thing online. So this wow. word is getting out to a lot of people. A, a lot of artists actually are watching this feed and learning a lot from you guys. So thanks for being so upfront and so honest. Um, someone in the chat room asked, which came first, the Leto periods with Grey's Anatomy, and which was the bigger spike in terms of fan activity? Well, the, the Grey's Anatomy, uh, we, we were, we're fortunate to have a, a great friend who is, he was an executive producer on uh, on the show, one of three of the executive producers. And and so when we, we had a, a debut studio EP release in 2009, you know, about a year and four months ago, um, the Poison and Wine EP. Just and um, it's four songs and, you know, it's essentially digital only and, um, you know, and then, you know, on the road. And so... You know, this is pre-Topspin, and um, so great. The, the short answer is that um, Poison and Wine, um, or the the Grey's Anatomy placement for Poison and Wine, happened over a year ago. So, you know, the spike then was a lot smaller because the audience was a lot smaller. But it definitely was a huge uh, piece of kind of getting the word out and you know, and kind of building that anticipation and that uh, that demand for. The Civil War. So I think that's important because uh, Jason, the the last part of that question is which was more vital to fan acquisition. And uh, while I I can't say fan acquisition isn't important, I mean I'm a marketer, I should be doing it. Um, I think that's asking the wrong question. I think the question is which one it got us on the you know more eyes on what we we're doing. It made people more aware of us. It made people more interested in us because I don't know if we were ready really to acquire fans when. You yeah, why it happened, but when, when it aired on Grey's Anatomy, but what did happen was uh, we, we had a video that was uploaded seconds before that show aired on YouTube, a music video that we had shot really quickly, um, and we watched that go through the roof, and we weren't seeing emails at all on those views, I mean, it's YouTube, you don't really take anything from them, but it started this just foundation of, of people really being aware of us and being able to drive it to something, and so even though we never acquired anything from it, it was pretty integrated. It, was, well, it, wasn't, yeah. it wasn't that position time yet, right? Yeah, yeah it, was it was just awareness. The steps on awareness. 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 It's yeah. so yeah. funny you say that. So we always talk about the top students and the final ones where you've got a bunch of people who don't know anything about you. So the first thing you're trying to do is build awareness. And however you do that is, is great. Yeah. Um, if you're lucky enough to build awareness, then you go fan connections. Yeah. Right. This, this is, this is a, a lot of awareness here, too, right? This yeah. life is awareness, too. Like, right. Hear the music, please. You don't have to sign up to hear it, you know, just, just hear it. Yeah. And then if you're lucky enough to actually have a relationship with fans, then you can bring it. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I think people, a lot of people try to, try to run for a walk, and I, I think yeah. you definitely back that up. No, that's the key. I mean, I think the philosophy has been building a relationship with fans instead of immediately, I mean, you, you don't come out of the gate and immediately ask somebody, you know, hey, it's nice to meet you, what's your address? You know, you, say, you, know, you pay six dollars for my album. Yeah. <laughs> so you know that was a lot of it. Was like yeah. let's, you know, I mean, in big brand, I mean, this is marketing. It's marketing one hundred and one. You know, Coke, they have a new product that comes out. They're spending you know hundreds of thousand dollars in samples. Right. You know, whether it be Coke Zero or whatever. So it's like yeah. for us, you know, we knew we had to create a demand by letting people 
discover and easily what it was that we had. And when it came time to for fan acquisition, which was thankfully when Leno, you know, two weeks before the album came out, you know, it was time to, to mm -hmm. ask for It was time to ask for new address. Yeah. Smart. Holding trap. Holding trap. Holding trap. Uh, there's another question from the web. Yeah, um, anybody in the room? Questions? In the yeah. panel. Are there third party uh, tools you guys use aside from the cross Um, You know, we can. There's, you mean, yeah, like mean, web tools or. I mean, aside from, you know, yeah. social networking, you know, I mean, That's sites like us. Facebook and Twitter. I mean, we've really essentially booked all of our tours. And you know, I think another point to make with um, with the free download, you know, and not asking for email addresses, was we. I think mm -hmm. I hope what we're doing is we're creating a culture with our fans that um, they keep in touch with us. And you know, I mean, we want to keep in touch with them too. And but you know, but in a sense that um, you know, Facebook and Twitter are places that they are, they are kind of watching what we're doing. And so um, you know, I think that's a that's a part of it that. Um, we really, you know, we kind of created that instead of like this immediate, like we're sending to them, we're sending emails to them. Do you so, look at it more as a conversation? Like, are you writing back to them regularly? Yes, yeah, definitely look at it as like a dialogue and a conversation. But in the sense of like, you know, not being invasive, you know, not being invasive, whether it be in an inbox or, you know, so um, having a point to our communication rather so, than to just communicate. Yeah. So the combination of Topspin, Twitter, and Facebook to us, I mean, is is a really key, and I, I hope that can continue. Um, but, you know, a lot of that, do you use, like, any uh, or, you know, do you guys use tweet, any, like, any, yeah, any, like, any, yeah, I mean, um, you guys use, like, optimize to split test your, like, I mean, we're Google Analytics, I, say, I, I mean, Google you know, Google analytics, using yeah. Google Analytics, you know, shortening links, I mean, <laughs> things as simple yeah. as that, but, um, yeah, oh, uh, Nate's right though. I mean, especially touring, the band tours heavily, uh, maybe a little too heavily. Uh, they right now, yeah. Um, but yeah. we uh, we've been selling out tours through Facebook and Twitter. It was essentially here's an event, here's the Post information, here's yeah. the ticket link, and we hope to see you there. And part of yeah, part of it is sorry. To no, no, go ahead. But part of it is really um, responding to the ethos of the band. The band and what's special about it is extremely simple. It's extremely classic and timeless, and mm -hmm. we know we live in a modern age. We live live in a digital age. We have to utilize this technology, but you can still utilize it in a way customized to your artist. And so this artist, you know, isn't one that things are highly. You know, it's not that well, 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 it's well, not, right. yeah, you know, right. there's, right. there's two people it's, in an acoustic. It's guitar. very right. organic right. and simple. So you know, we're trying to keep a lot of our philosophy and our approach within the the the, the technology we use somewhat simple you know there's got to be a it, it's a simple sophistication you know i right. think that's kind of our even in the way we skin to the talks in sight you know right. and keep it simple keep it clear right. you know and, and for other bands uh it might be it, it yeah. makes sense to do it different ways and to have a lot of things going on but for us it's just keep it easy mm -hmm. um sorry, question. Oh, sorry. we'll do one in the room and then we'll do one Go ahead. Oh, sorry if i missed this one there but are you just giving away anything the, what are your windows um, yeah, I mean, Barton Hall is up there. Yeah, Barton Hall is available. Um, the you know the the live album um, that has been up is still up. We're not we're not featuring it as much. I mean, I think for a, close to a year from July two thousand nine until the end of the summer in two thousand ten, it was literally a banner on our MySpace page, and we had our you know our uh, domain name you know civilwars.com forwarded to that MySpace page out of just sheer necessity and on the road too they would pretty much close the show but if you like it download it we have a free album you know? yeah so you know obviously the you know the focus now is on the album the focus is on you know kind of more of the you know the we were bidding adieu to the you know to the um traditional album cycle in a sense but um we want that to stay up you know i think there'll be ways that um we're gonna we want to continue to incorporate free and i think as the band grows and as the demand grows we'll just have to adjust how we incorporate free into, you know, the plan. So yeah, so the free free download of Barton Hollow and the live album are still available. We talked about the de the live album. We've had times where it was like, okay, we fifty thousand people have downloaded this. Is should it stay free? And every time, you know, a hundred thousand people have downloaded, it should say free, no email address. 
every time we just said yes. Like, why the hell not? You know? I mean, there are other ways, like like uh, Ian was saying, to, to require fan acquisition, and that's that's what we've done since then with Topspin. But uh, I think we're of the belief, and especially just in terms of free music, if it takes that to get someone to listen, we're willing to do that. You know, if, if, if they're not going to pay an email address, or if they're not going to pay $5 for it, we're willing to do it for free. I, I, think, I think the thing to keep in mind is that you, you know, you've always got people who are at all places in that file mm -hmm. coming every day. Right? There's some people who are like, oh, I heard a little something, I don't know, maybe I want to try it out. Or maybe they might not be willing to pay, they might not give you the email address. So just building that awareness is yeah. sort of step one. Yeah. You, know, so you, but for the, you kind of want to have something for everybody. Because like, yeah, exactly. that, that, that to me is an interesting thing about the internet is that we, you know, I, I once upon a time thought that, that the internet was about sort of going digital, but I don't, I don't think it is. I think it's about consumer choice and having a broader range of, of choice than, than we used to have. Sure. And that means like touching people at all points of that of yeah. that, of that funnel and yeah. of, of, along that journey. Even if you guys get to a much different place, there's still far more people in the world who've never heard of this band than you have. That a free so, live album is still a great entry point. For yeah, exactly. A free live yeah. album is, you know, without any Yeah, right. and I, I mean, uh, something else I want to note too with, with this, um, this free live album is you know, I, I continue to kind of wrestle with the idea of free in the sense of recorded music, um, because you know when you're when it's recorded music, it's um, it's you're spending more money on it and you're spending more time on it, and that's something that you really have to weigh the benefit. And so for this band, it just ends up being that what they do is easily transferable in a, in a live setting because it's so simple. The live thing it, it was a it was a way to get people to um you know to get a picture of who they were essentially as a li I'm not I'm not a big fan of I'm not a big fan of um of live albums honestly I'm I just have never been a huge fan but for this band it really works you know I have a I'm I'm wrestling with you know I have another band and they have a free EP right now and um, you know, it's a recorded, you know, I mean, they spent a lot of time and, you know, not as much money, but they spent a lot of time on it. And, you know, for me, that weighs a lot more. Um, so, you, know, you just have to kind of... Yeah, I mean, we've time. seen success in sort of all fronts of different giveaways. It's interesting, uh, you know, Trent Reznor and then the couple campaigns we've worked on with him, he kind of, he kind of broke things apart. Of course, he's a very different kind of audience and somebody that's, he doesn't go with the simple technologies. We've probably tried all kinds of things before settling on, on different mixes and, and his, um, uh, released a, for two campaigns for How to Destroy Angels, which is a new band that he's working on, and then the Social Network soundtrack, um, which is a big seller for Topspin this year. He released a sampler of five songs of the recorded music for free. Um, on How to Destroy Angels, you could actually purchase the lossless version of that for, I think, a couple dollars. Yes. And that did tremendously yeah, well. Bucks. Yeah, for so two or three bucks. Yeah, for two or three bucks. It's sort of similar to what Brad Dyer is doing as well. Right. Um, you know, giving, giving away, you know, kind of the regular old MP3 version of the album that you're going to get on a cost sharing network anyway. Exactly. You know, selling upgrade to lossless, selling upgrade to vinyl. Right. At that point, right. it, it's almost like a lost leader. It's, yeah. it's right. give something to hopefully get something. And that's kind of what I was saying earlier is uh, if you trust your brand, you trust the music, you trust the people around it, uh, all you can do is hope that they come by. I think we all are resigned to the fact that we can't force people to buy music. It's so easy to get music without our permission to download it. You just almost have to let go. And I think a lot of people probably need to hear that. Like right. you can't make people buy music. And if you accept that, then the, the, the paradigm shift becomes yeah. All I can do is hope that they like it and that they will come back and buy it. So the, the you giving can earn, away, you can earn. I believe you can earn the right. Yeah, you know, with quality, music. like quality music, quality performances, fan engagement, you earn it. But with giving away like half of an album or lower quality uh, recordings of the album or I guess files of the album, yeah. you're essentially it's almost like a trust. It's like right. I'll put this out here, trusting that you'll come back to me because I know it's that good. I know I believe that this band and, is worth it, and it's worked. We've seen it work. Yeah, right. and you know people had didn't have to go and buy the you know, the lossless version of some of these things they've heard, um, and then when when vinyl versions were put out, I mean we've seen people even buy you know an entire record and then the entire record bundled with the T-shirt and the vinyl configurations. You know, mm -hmm. 
because of having a family. We did. Right. That's true. One of the case studies you were talking about last year was the Van Farlow one where right. they were selling the entire album for a dollar. And then they were able to have something like a third of those people come mm -hmm. back. The people, people who had already bought it for a dollar, they already had the record, but they came back and bought the box yeah. set. Yeah. So it was a right. great record. Right. And they offered a really unique package and, and right. people did, did go for it. So yeah. You guys did that with, uh, is it Twin Shadow? With, with Chris Taylor's, um, Chris Taylor, Grizzly Bear, he has a um, I know Twin Shadow, I don't know if we, Shadow, I didn't work on it. I think it was like a dollar, another dollar yeah. purchase. It's a cool yeah. idea, I mean, Ben Farland did it for a period of time in July, you know, they've had 800 something um, purchases of it, and during that period when it was a dollar, it was 13,000. Okay. And then it was, you know, NPR's best of the year in the top 10, so there was some momentum that carried yeah. through from that. Definitely. I think it's important to emphasize too, this might be too philosophical, but it's not about devaluing art. It's not about saying art shouldn't be paid for. I think it's just about engaging fans where they're at and being willing to meet them there. Um, you know, we could have hours worth of arguments over RIA and you know all the digital rights and all that type of thing. I don't think. I mean, there's a place for that, and I think as musicians and as managers, we're responsible to to carry the torch in those fronts. But we're also responsible to our artists to do what's best for them and get them in front of a lot of people. You know. And if that's that's what it takes, maybe not everybody's willing to do that, but obviously there are people who are willing to do that. Smart. Right. You have another question from the web. Yeah, one last question from the web is, what um, what Tosman tools have you not used yet, um, and what are you thinking about using that Tosman does? Take you make that up. <laughs> <laughs> you biz <bizzed> out. <laughs> T ticketing is an interesting People one. Want to know. <laughs> yeah, we've definitely talked about ticketing. Um, like I said, both in terms of bundling, just to increase the value, uh, doing premium to our email list members, you know, get first access. Um, I've been thinking a lot about this this lost leader type of mentality of um, maybe you send an email out to your email list saying, hey, here's a track for free. You're the only ones who are going to be able to get it for free. You're also the only ones who are going to be able to buy four other tracks. So hopefully, and uh, giving them an incentive. I, I think that's part of where you have pockets of fans spread out over the internet. It's making each one feel special. You're our Facebook fans. You need to feel like you're getting special treatment. You are. You are email list. You, and there's crossover, but you try to seg segment them. And so by giving an exclusive to one group and maybe incentivizing to buy an extra exclusive. Um, I don't even think just rewarding the fans that have decided to connect with you so far. Yeah. You know, your shows are selling out everywhere. So if those fans get to, just by the privilege of being connected to you, sure. if they get to buy tickets first, that's a real benefit to being part of that list. Yeah. And, yeah, and that's definitely something we really want to do, especially um, as venues grow, too. It, it right. makes a lot more sense to, right. um, because you have the capacity to do those things. I right. think with the smaller venues, um, it tends to be a little more complicated. Uh, the venue owners are like, what? You know? right. <laughs> but um, as you get a little bit, that's something that's definitely on the horizon for us. Cool. Well, very cool. Other questions, comments in the room? How is, how is um, all this stuff translated into the live? What size of venues are you using right now? You know, a lot of this has been. Um, we're, we're massively underplaying for the next few months. Um, mm -hmm. In New York, they just play, they play two shows. They're both sold out about three weeks in advance. Um, Joe's Pub and um, Rockwood Music Hall Stage 2. So Joe's Pub is, what, 300? Once, once in the Rockwood. Okay. Okay. And then, no, and then Rockwood's around the same. Right? It's like 165. They, they have an 80 cap, and then they have their brand new room that's like 165. So, um, you know, a good example is Minneapolis. Um, you know, we went, we've been to Minneapolis once. It was uh, last August. We just had the EP. It was the first time in the market and they did like 90 pay, which is, we were really happy with. You know, first time in the city ever, no full length. Um, we announced Minneapolis two weeks ago and um, the, the room is like 125. We had two shows, two, um, two nights in a row, 125 cap room. They sold out in 20 minutes. Wow. So we added um, we added uh, the Varsity Theater, which is 650. Um, we added that last Friday, and I think we're already at like 350 on that. So it's wow. like a matinee show. So um, it's definitely translating. And you know, some of that's the album release, some of it's you know, added, et 
exposure and uh, some of it is just finally getting to some of these places we've never been. You know, a lot of the markets we've never been or at this point now we're doing, you know, Louisville. We've never played a proper show in Louisville. And um, I think it just sold out last week at 408. So, um, yeah, so it's, gr I mean, our goal is to get to that two to 3,000 seat theater level. And that's, you know, that's where we want. I, I don't know for this band, it's so simple. I don't know if we want to go beyond that. You know, we'll, we'll know, I think, closer when we get there. So. Okay. Yeah. How are you? All right, cool. Yeah.